almost at five after here, so why don't we go ahead and get started? So we have our um, agenda up, and uh, we have two group members who vol kindly volunteered to actually lead discussions today. Uh, so we have Martha Anderson, who's the head of the Mullins Library Digital Services Department at the University of Arkansas. The she's going to be um, leading a discussion on the role of artificial intelligence now and in the future for digital preservation and appraisal. And uh, we also have Dale Poulter, who is the Director of Library Technology and Digital Services at Vanderbilt University, uh, talking about um, our, well, their 321 approach, anybody's 321 approach who wants to um, add to it. Uh, but specifically, Dale was mentioning are multiple AWS zones adequate or are regions needed? Um, so that should definitely be an interesting conversation as well. So thank you both Martha and Dale for volunteering to lead talks. We really appreciate it. Okay. I think. All right. So without further ado, uh, Martha, do you want to start us off by leading the discussion? Sure, and may I share the screen? Okay, yeah, let me make sure you can do that. Hmm. Let me try to see if it... Yeah, I think you should... I actually don't it, have... Okay, you got it, great. Yeah. Can you see uh, my title? Yep. On the screen? Okay. That's good. All right. Okay. So, Eric, thanks for inviting me to talk um, about AI today. And for everyone else, again, I'm Martha Anderson. I work at the University of Arkansas Libraries, and I am the head of digital services. Um, as far as my own perspective or positionality statement, um, I work at an academic institution, follow SAA, SAA or the Society of American Archivists News and Guidelines. I am interested in mass digitization workflows, digital preservation, artificial intelligence, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I am bilingual, Spanish, English, and love my work and attempt to excel at it. Emphasis on attempt. Um, the topic is on the, screen, on the screen, the role of AI now and in the future for digital preservation and appraisal. And while I am talking to you about this um, topic, I realized that AI or, or automation has been around for at least a decade. However, it's the last few years, going back five years, that it has sparked my attention due to the multiplicity of AI apps and perhaps uses in the archival field. Why this topic? Well, based on existing workloads and backloads at most academic institutions, automation is no longer an option it is a necessity. Some of the challenges on implementing AI and or automation to appraisal and digital preservation could be, how do we measure for accuracy? What does good enough while implementing AI looks like? What are the risks? What is an acceptable risk? How can we be accountable for decisions we make based on machine learning outputs? How do we equally hold machines into account? How do we compensate for the change in the digital record over time? And one that is very dear to me is how, do, how and how often do we return existing algorithms? When I reflect on my own institution's opportunities, I have to consider uh, the print materials backlogs and the incredible amount of digital records in need of processing for appraisal and or, and or digital preservation. 
as well as the vast amount of data linked or related to the content under consideration, and of course, the cost of men or women power of doing all this work. I wonder what can machines or AI applications do well regarding my own troubles? Uh, what humans or archivists do well in relation to AI implementation? And how can we coexist? The first question, what can machines do well? From my interactions in AI, will I, say, I can say that Boolean and key sources are great. Uh, regular expressions work well also. Uh, processing at scale, definitely a plus. Under, understanding context and inference, um, that would be a no for me. And handwritten or handwriting analysis, it will be a no. In contrast, what can humans do well? Uh, Processing a scale is, is enough for me, and I doubt a lot of people will challenge me on that assessment. Um, understanding and inferring context, a yes, and handwriting analysis, a yes, also. Based on my own uh, research and AI training, there have been two approaches in the last five years to addressing appraisal and digital preservation. Uh, one of, I refer to one of them as an off-the-shelf approach, and the second one as trusting AI. So you might wonder what is the difference. The off-the-shelf approach, it has to do with um, having an institutional need in solving the issue or, go ahead. Oh, my. Martha, I just want to make sure that we're, uh, we should be looking at this one slide here, or if there are others that you had. I'm getting ready to, to, to start the, this was just the intro, I'm getting ready to show the examples, but yeah, we're, we're good. Okay. But thank you for checking. This is a, <laughs> no good, problem. This right. a good one. Yeah, so thank you. Thank you. Um, the off-the-shelf approach, again, um, with addressing an institutional need uh, to solve an issue or several issues, um, utilizing something created by somebody else, either proprietary or open source. In other words, using AI concepts and technologies to solve ongoing archival issues. Now, this is where we switch um, because I wanted to, hold on, this, all right, I need to move this thing, so, okay. So what are some examples of off-the-shelf approach? And I'm not gonna explain all of this, applications or platforms in detail, because I do feel that uh, you know uh, most of them. Uh, one of them is Aeon, which as we know, is a uh, workflow management software. Another off the shelf ap approach, EPAD for um, um, email archiving. Bit curator, um, it is, oh yeah. Bit curator for um, digital forensics and data analysis tools uh, to process born digital materials. Another example could be, and uh, of course it's not all inclusive, um, ARC extract um, that um, has to do with natural language processing tools and methods uh, to apply to large digital text collections and build a web application that um, could uh, provide uh, command lines to be able to analyze this massive text. And the last example I have here, uh, transcribers, uh, um, for that exactly transcribing historical documents, usually handwritten. Um, what I tried uh, transcribers in the past, one of the things that I like the most is that we have the option of many languages um, to transcribe handwritten text. Now this section where I'm planning to spend a little bit uh, more time is the trusting AI approach, which has to do with a more involved 
archive, archivist approach, um, in other words, applying ar archival concepts and principles to AI applications development, um, thus creating your own apps. Uh, one of those examples, here we go, is the, um, this is an institute, the IDEA um, Institute on Artificial Intelligence. In this case, IDEA stands for Innovation, Disruption, Inquiry, and Access. Um, this is one of the institutes I participated as a fellow in 2021. And what's interesting here is the many approaches to solving ongoing issues. So here is the site in case that you would like to explore a little bit uh, more about it. Um, this is perhaps the section of the website that I like the most because it tells you about publications on AI and what other authors who have participated in the Institute directly or indirectly have done. So there is the section of publications, um, centers, projects, initiatives, um, past and future conferences and workshops. And when we go to the top, uh, um, there is a section for blogs and where the authors of the many ongoing um, AI uh, projects in the United States have um, posted commentary or explain their own projects. And there are about 43 projects ongoing at this time. Another example of is InterParis that stands for um, International Research on Permanent Authentic uh, Records in Electronic Systems. And it's this section right here. I definitely have learned a lot from this platform also. Here you can see what um, the InterParis Trust AI project stands for and um, a look at um, various nations depending on the continent they're participating from. Uh, the InterParis uh, Trust AI project is a five-year project and you can tell what has done in the past in 2021 and through 2022. Right now we are right here in the third year of implementation. And I like uh, the topic. Um, which is establishing how archival concepts and principles can inform the development the development of responsible AI. Um, so this tells you about the five years and the objectives for every single year. And then here, uh, this is a little bit misleading because these are the research studies, but uh, it's more than 10, it's about 43. So let's say that uh, you are interested in one of these projects. Let's say um, the this one right here. It takes you to to the page and um, explains briefly what is the project about. But if you are able to deduce which ones are the authors uh, for the uh, project, um, these people are very open-minded. They answer to any questions that, that you might have. There is one, um, if I remember correctly, on arrangement and description in archives. Um, there is one for um, digitization workflows. So I feel that there is a little bit for everybody if you are get, developing your own AI apps. Um, so why is this? Um, topic important or, or the conclusion to this uh, very short conversation is that the AI uh, landscape is changing and definitely affects the information and data landscape. Um, for me, if I were to ask something to the audience, it will be to 
to consider uh, being more than a user, the, to be an active leader to, in AI, to better serve the new upcoming uh, generations. Um, in the field, we know that there is fear to AI tools and usually has to do with um, employment uh, retention or facing change, if you wish. Um, so it will be nice to focus traditional tasks uh, and to shift them to a new direction that embraces advanced technologies. And again, from the beginning, I, I disclose that this is one of my research interests. And yep, yeah, I'm asking for your help. And that's all I have. I'm open to questions. Great, thank you, Martha. I appreciate the presentation. And walking through all the, the different projects over there. Um, so yeah, definitely we should uh, op open up the uh, to questions for Martha. And um, yeah, feel free to put anything in the chat as well. I have, I have uh, one, okay, yeah, Nathan. Thank you, Martha. Um, what, it seems like, you know, there's a lot happening right now. And some of it's still being worked out and there's, there's a lot of active work, but what do you see as the most useful potential application or intersection with digital preservation? Um, where where might be an appropriate intersection if you can tell at this point if it's not still too you know we're still uh, we're still plotting the stars at this point yeah i i think um at this point a lot of of the process is are on their development like in my conclusion i stated that what is um puzzling to me is how quickly all of these apps are um, developing or advancing. Just to give you an example, and it will make sense eventually, I promise. Uh, to, um, 2021, when I attended the IDEA Institute, we were talking about um, having apps for the different stages of the research process. And somebody said that at that point, and this is just 2022, 2021, there will be a time where we will have the research, research project done with one app, hence chat GPT and other competitors to chat GPT. What I see right now that is, is not alarming, but it's, it's exciting to see applying um, different apps to the different steps of appraisal and um, digital preservation and the possibility that there will be a time where we could um, have everything at once. I know it's a dream, I mean, a big, big dream, but if it is possible, why not? Um, I can also, again, you know, like the short answer, no, there is a, not one size addresses the whole process, but the opportunities, like I have a, a project that came up just last week and it has to do with um, digitizing uh, micro records. And I have rooms and rooms of micro records to potentially digitize. Well, if you have the equipment, I have the, um, the possibility right now of scanning micros film at the rate of a thousand scans in 20 minutes, which which for me that is tremendous. I don't have that capability as far as metadata indexing and all of that good stuff. So it would be nice if we could add more to it. But the, the nice thing about it is having a lot of developers working on the different threads to that workflow. Thanks for the question though. I see there's a question in the chat from Scott. 
Are you aware of any places already using AI in their workflows in a production setting? Yeah, um, some, um, I think that definitely at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, where the AI Institute uh, was held in 2021. And out of the examples I gave you from Inter Paris, there is one um, university in Italy, and I cannot tell you exactly the the name of the location but is on the website that is dealing with transcribing very very um, old handwritten uh, records that has to do with um, identifying the scripteners of the middle ages and that takes a lot of work but um, it's, it's a big production setting uh, a lot of people involved in that project and it seems to be working but it's in the inter-Paris site. Um, actually, Stephen is mentioning, oh, right. Um, the DPC recently hosted a webinar on the use of AI in uh, digital preservation with speakers presenting from a number of topics, uh, inter interesting case studies, and then I believe there's another uh, webinar that's coming up, part two, which is on March 22nd. Uh, not sure which time zone though. So, yeah. Yeah, and they had, they, oh, sorry. No, I had a lot of information coming up from the DPC also. Right, right. Oh, and uh, the recording is now available for DPC members. In general, these kinds of things are eventually opened up to the public, yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, the presentations, uh, at least there were a few that were linked there on that site that you can download uh, as well. So I have um, one question. It's, it's uh, more, more of a general question, but did um, Martha, did you, you know, across all the different uh, uh, services and projects that you were discussing, um, are there common threads that you, you were able to see in terms of directions or anything that these projects are going, like, you know, ethical considerations or starting places or other things like that? Uh, yes, uh, there are several frameworks on their development for ethical considerations on, on EI. Um, obviously, um, the uh, redacting of um, uh, personal identifiable information. Um, the, the common thread that I see and then some Sometimes people miss because we are so focused into new softwares that we forget to make that huge correlation between creating something in data that at the end of the day, AI is about data. And that's what we're trying to, to do to use the existing data where in whatever format we have it to provide context to the applications we are created to better understand the historical record. And um, another thing that I would like to mention that is, is a challenge right now when it comes to the AI and also ethical considerations for appraisal, it will be that when one as a developer is um, creating or crafting, um, an application to do a positionality statement. We seldom find on our current records something that says so-and-so archivist processed this work and here is the background about the archivist and beliefs and things like that that could help to better understand how something was created and if something was missed because we can learn from our own errors. So let's say that I created an application and I missed something, but I have it in my documentation, right? And then somebody else could come after me and say, huh, I wonder how will this application work if we consider the misses as a positive thing, right? Not so much criticism, but in trying to make the application to function better. I think, thank you, Ed. Um, 
it kind of brings to mind the uh, I had looked at the Library of Congress slides uh, from the DPC for seminar or webinar and um, there was a mention of courses like crowdsourcing and combination of crowdsourcing and, and machine learning and um, you know what are the benefits for that and that that I think is um, a, you know really interesting like crossroads there as well to make sure that we bring multiple people's perspectives to the table and everything while you know uh, you know, bettering the results of like maybe the initial pass that um, machine learning has gone through and, and taken. So, yeah, yeah. Um, all right. Do folks have other questions to, uh, for Martha? Uh, give it a minute here. Let's see. Okay. Yeah, Nathan. Martha, um, for the the sort of off the shelf AI, so to speak, and to even to some degree, the sort of um, AI tools that you could apply that are available from Azure and Microsoft and Amazon. Um, are there any risks for cultural heritage folks in using those products? Um, are we are we unwittingly contributing towards a corpus um, that'll be used for commercial purposes, right? Do we, if we want to use these, do we need to find a vendor that we can use which won't inform a corpus? Maybe it depends on the collection, but I know we have stuff that we might want to apply AI to for insights, but we don't have the rights, right, to share it to become part of a corpus for someone else's training set. Yeah, an amazing question. Um, I so yes, I mean what we know now, right, and what we could know then. You know, like we do know that there are ethical considerations to everything we do, and and even when we're talking about data and testing the apps, who is in the data and who is not in the data. So yes, uh, yes, but again, you know, I don't think there is a I could not tell you use this app and you will include everybody because it's not like that. And that's why for me it's very important to know to have some provenance on how the uh, app was created, who was in the in the process, what was the way of thinking, what are your beliefs, why did you select this data set, why did you include, why did these people or groups were important to you and not others, is everybody represented? So my brain is with you, you know, like I, I would like for everybody to, to be included, but um, again, I draw the distinction with the, um, with the print collection, right? So we were talking about when we're trying to be diverse, equitable, inclusive, uh, modern, if you wish, we want uh, every topic right. But did we think of all authors? Did we think of all nations? Did we think about the same subject uh, seen from another nation point of view? So what, and that's what I say, what are we know and what we will know in the future. We don't have all of the answers, yes. But it's a development a developing or evolving field. Thanks for your question, Nate. Steven. And Steven. Uh, yeah, uh, Nathan, um, I, I can appreciate your the concern you, you articulated um, and why I would agree that we would want to have some protection against sort of direct use of, of our, our materials in in an overtly commercial manner, but in the same token, having having our production data being fed back into training a training set is only going to make the tool better for for the purposes for which we're trying to exploit it. So I think it's it's there's a there's a bit of a nuanced line that we're going to need to walk um, to balance you know competing um, competing benefits. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely agree. Okay, uh, one more call for questions for Martha. 
and we're about 12.35 right now, so just want to keep an eye on the time. Um, okay, just a note from Miriam in the chat, my worry would also involve uh, if a commercial product is used and then that product is acquired by a VC firm, yeah, or something, right? That's, which can certainly happen. Right, and then the ownership of the training data transfers as well, and then the use may vary, right? Good point. Okay, uh, well, let's, um, yeah, thank you very much, Martha, again, thank for you. a great discussion. Okay, much appreciate it. And let's go ahead and move on. So, uh, yeah, Dale, would you be willing to start up on your discussion? Yes, I'm going to share. Um, first of all, thanks, Martha. That was great. Um, sadly, mine is not going to be nearly as exciting. Um, <laughs> um, let's see, let me see my screen now. Here we go. Uh, so, a quick synopsis of where we were at. Um, back in um, Vanderbilt University, has been um, digitizing things for several years. Um, our largest collection right now is the Television News Archive, which has um, broadcast from 1968 to the present. Um, in 2022, um, if we exclude the um, TV News Archive, which is a completely separate uh, a challenge, um, we had a total of about 30 terabytes of preservation data. Um, all of that set on campus, on campus storage, and we had some. In the, we had a copy in the cloud, and we had a copy um, at JSTOR. So we were good. Three, two, one was was rocking for us without any problem. Um, in March of 2022, we received funding for significant um, digitization, and by July July 1st, 2022, we had gained another 200 terabytes worth of digital, uh, digital, digitized materials. So we were quickly running out of room. Um, campus also decided it was time to uh, change up the storage network locally. And so we've been pressed on trying to determine where to go and, and how to handle this. Of course, the goal is we wanna make sure that we can always make sure that the data is available um, long-term uh, for future generations. So for those who are not familiar with uh, 321, uh, 321 includes is three copies of data. That's three complete copies um, so that um, you can easily roll back to one. Um, it's easy to see, especially nowadays with ransomware, the entire copy being corrupted somehow. Um, and so having them um, uh, three copies is important. Two different media types of technologies um, back when the 321 uh, philosophy was sort of established, our standard was established, um, uh, in many cases you had two copies locally on local drives, and then you had one copy on tape. Um, the goal was to make sure that if those drives, if your entire uh, infrastructure for your storage died, you would still have your tape backup. You still have something um, that you go back to so that the data would not be lost, which is of course, the goal. And the goal was to have one copy um, off-site. So if we look at on-premise costs now, um, they continue to grow, um, not only staffing and hardware costs, which although per, per terabyte seems to be going down, if you look at the overall cost because of the amount of storage required, overall costs seems to continue to increase. Um, and then of course, with space here, we've uh, made a, a strong initiative to um, research um, IT, and that has reduced the amount of um, space available to academic computing within the uh, data center, which is of course a challenge. So if 321 is still appropriate becomes the question. And if not, what, what's the solution? Um, we still feel like that the, the logic behind it is applicable. I mean, we need to make sure that the data is preserved. We have one copy in production, we quickly a co copy available, and then one that's not available easily. 
Um, this would be your 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 fell over your your panic everything is gone copy. Um, and so we've been looking more at utilizing um, Amazon Web Services and, and, and S3 storage, specifically intelligent tiering, looking down to um, uh, Glacier uh, for cost uh, reasons. So if we copy into different two different zones, uh, if you're familiar with um, Amazon, Amazon has several different regions around the world. And each region has several, several zones within that region. And the zones are like East Coast, West Coast, um, excuse me, the regions are East Coast, West Coast, and so forth, um, where the zones are, um, if you look at, uh, are, are just about, they have to be around 60 miles apart. I believe it's at least 60 miles apart. Um, and so, you know, if the entire east, east coast of the U.S. was uh, wiped out, if we have everything in one zone, of course, it's gone. Um, but the question is, is that, that still, is 60 miles apart adequate? Um, even if we in, end up doing more than one uh, region, um, then is is that adequate or do we need to do two different cloud services? So like Amazon and Azure. Um, it is possible to quickly do a snapshot, um, but that quickly becomes um, expensive when you're looking at you know, 200 terabytes, you take a snapshot of that uh, bucket and you immediately double that and you have three or four of those and you quickly become, um, you quickly come to the attention of your CFO. Um, the other copy, the, the other question is, is putting a copy on tape locally adequate? Uh, so having most of the copies remote uh, in the cloud and then just having one copy local instead of remote. So those are my questions. That's the quandary that we're currently in. Um, and I would love to have ideas, feedback, thoughts, are we overthinking this, which often happens? All right, thank you, Dale. Thanks for walking through that. You have questions or ideas that we want to share? Open up the conversation. I was note from Nathan in the chat, uh, two different cloud providers in geographically separated regions, the new geo-redundant storage. And from Michelle, I think there is a difference between a, a managed copy. Sorry, that last statement got cut off. There's a difference between a copy and a managed copy. So I, it's unclear to me, Dale, in your design, whether your copies are managed copies, that is that you're doing fixity checks on them and doing comparisons across your copies, or whether you're just keeping separate copies. Uh, they are managed, two of them are managed copies uh, currently. Um, the ones that are with JSTOR or with, a, with another provider, I believe that they're managed, but I do not know firsthand that they are. I don't know the, all the steps are going to be going through there. And we generally run most of those are on a single copy, uh, but we do usually once a year try to run it against the other copy. If we find something wrong on the on the, on the production, what we call the production copy, we can always copy it back from the older copy. So that's sort of the way we do that check. I would offer a, a moderately dissenting opinion, and there's plenty of room for uh, opinion here. Um, our, our model suggests that maybe two local tapes at different sites plus a cold cloud copy um, is going to be sufficient for almost all cases. Um, everybody you know, looks at it differently. But um, you know, having the tapes relatively close means that you can. it's relatively easy to cycle them in and uh, check them and then cycle them back out to a storage facility. And I should mention also, it's considerably more economical because once you buy the tapes, you're looking at 15 years of sunk costs. And as I always like to say, we're just marching in place until we have DNA storage in 15 years. 
if you're using two tape copies and one cold cloud copy, none of those are used for active, none of those are sort of actively managed or actively available, correct? Yeah, this would be a, a darker kind of uh, preservation for us. Uh, but we do have a copy on site that we could go to and pull, uh, pull data off within a couple hours if we needed to. So one close, one remote copy. Right. Thanks, Edson. Um, and then I see an, a note from David in the chat. How viable is Blu-ray disc backup for completely offline copies? Or is there some other technology that achieves the same ends? I'm not sure about Blu-ray or, or, or CD storage. Um, my, my belief, my personal belief is that they're not over reliable, um, not over tape at least, but um, I don't have anything to back that up. Maybe others on the call are more familiar with the uh, reliability of Blu-ray. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, Nathan, you had mentioned there's an option at Panasonic.net. Yeah, um, I'm definitely pro tape um, for a variety of reasons, if you can do that. But yeah, so similar to tape for an offline copy, there are optical media storage systems. Panasonic has a, the most recent one that I know of. Um, and they market it as a pretty reliable for long-term storage. Um, you know, it would work like a tape deck in the same sort of robotic library type fashion. Um, Fujifilm also has um, a tape library with an S3 front end. I think Spectrologic Black Pearl also, offer, also offers an S3 front end to tape storage. So that can sometimes ease some of the friction that comes with working with cold copies. Um, uh, certainly to be details to work out, but, but yes, you can definitely still have offline local storage options. Okay, and then um, Martha asked, uh, how often are the AWS files accessed for retrieval? Our, our live copy for us is um, they're available and they're I would like to say there are all of our resources are accessed constantly, but um, some of them are not accessed for you know years at a time, um, a lie dormant. Um, but some, a few of them are accessed often. The TV news is really interesting um, in watching as their video happens, if something happens in the news, uh, such as a bank crash, uh, which we recently had. It, it's amazing how many times certain videos have been reviewed again, a uh, news broadcast from like 2008 or the 70s. Thanks, Bill. All right, do we have other uh, questions or thoughts? I think the, um, oh, uh, let's see, David mentioned, has anyone looked into decentralized storage? That's a really good question. We haven't. Yeah, I know. Oh, oh go ahead, Nathan. You're going to say something. Um, I was going to share. So there's I'm trying to find a link for it. Um, Starling is mm -hmm. a distributed. There we go. It's based on Filecoin. So Starling is sort of a, a front end of Filecoin, which is itself a front end for IPFS. Um, for distributed blockchain-based storage. Starling is specifically designed for cultural heritage memory organizations and sort of provides a, a brokering um, between the, the sort of sellers of Filecoin storage offers and the, um, the entity looking to back it up. Um, and I believe, I don't know if it's there yet, but it was going to automatically, you put in the conditions, you know, the type of storage you want, and it will take care of 
managing it and moving it if something um, later comes on with that vendor or if they go offline or something. Sounds interesting. Sounds like it might address the issue of, of hardware issues after if you've had this in storage for a while, the retrieval hardware for the media. Um, Courtney? Yeah, um, I just wanted to bring something up that I recently heard about. Um, I was talking several weeks ago with Peter Van Garderen, who um, created um, Access to Memory and also Archivematica. Um, right now, he's working on um, a project focused on decentralized land rights records. Um, and what's really great about that is it's decentralized storage from a particularly archival perspective. And so really, you know, speaking to digital preservation from more of a cultural heritage perspective and approaching it in that way. Um, it's called Landano um, is the project. Um, and I'm really excited to see how it's going. Um, it's got international involvement um, and I think it's really interesting to watch. Awesome, thanks Courtney. And thank you everyone for posting all the links in the chat. Uh, I will try to um, grab these and put them into the notes. Or if you have a minute to paste them in there, that would be wonderful too. Um, and uh, let's see, Stephanie would mention, speaking of storage mediums, does anybody have thoughts about the potential of DNA storage? And uh, Nathan's mentioning um, Yale is experimenting with twist bioscience on DNA storage, that's right. And a note from Edson, we're 15, 20 years away, but it's real and promising exabytes per gram. Absolutely. And a thousand year lifespan. Yeah. And as long as we can sequence, no matter what, we'll be set. Which you should be able to. It hasn't come up, but there are also nano visual techniques for storing data long term. Um, so there's a company called Dots. Um, I think there's another company called Nanofiche. Um, there's a new player on the scene that I'm not familiar with and I'm forgetting their name. There's also a new company that's using ceramic, um, ceramic coating on a different type of medium. Um, but they're, they're all sort of trying to use visual techniques to preserve either binary data or in the case of dots and nanofiche, um, the actual like image itself. And they could even, um, dots and fiche, I think both have the ability to do um, RGB encoded video as well, that would later have to be recombined. Um, but the, uh, the fact that, you know, you just need a magnifying device and a light source, um, you know, it's not um, entrapped in binary coding. Um, it's also the dots. I think the dots are like nearly indestructible. The nanofiche has been sent to the moon. Um, I think it was included in an uh, Israeli um, group. Yeah, pickles, another one option out there too. Sorry, I'm talking a lot. I'll stop. Yeah, thank you everyone for mentioning all these ideas and what the forthcoming technologies. And then uh, Stephen had, <clears throat> had mentioned that uh, the Library of Congress is designing storage architectures workshops coming up next week. Uh, the past few years, this has included sessions on DNA and other al alternative as well as traditional storage solutions. And they um, they also tend to share everyone's presentations afterwards. All 
All right, well, Dale, thank you very much for the presentation and for asking any questions and for and sharing ideas. Uh, hopefully, some of this discussion has been helpful. Um, and we're, you know, definitely up for continuing discussions on Slack or through the notes or otherwise. Thank you for all the so suggestions. Thanks again. Oh, sir. Thank you for all the suggestions, everyone. All right, well, just a, another round of thanks for both uh, Martha and Dale. And uh, let's see, we're kind of getting to the top of the hour here, about five minutes left. Um, I did want to mention that our uh, our next meeting is uh, scheduled for June 26th. And uh, we have, uh, of course, the other topics that we've got posted at the poll. I mentioned the poll in the meeting notes. and. So if folks want to reach out uh, and propose talks on any of those topics, please uh, reach out to myself and Robin, and um, we'll try to set up some time. So uh, appreciate, every, appreciate everyone joining us for today, and uh, it's definitely a couple of great discussions. Thanks so much, and uh, we'll see you in June. Okay, right. take care, everyone.